there. Welcome to this episode of Health Options. I am Rabi Abdullah. Nigeria's image and status got a boost on the global medical arena following the election of one of her own, a consultant family physician at the University of Benin Teaching Hospital and former president of the Nigerian Medical Association, NMA, Dr. Osahon Enabulele, as the president of the Commonwealth Medical Association. It will interest you to know that this is the first time a Nigerian ever got to occupy the position since the establishment of the Commonwealth Medical Association some 57 years ago. How will the emergence of a Nigerian to the position of the president of the Commonwealth Medical Association impact on the country's health care system? What innovation is he bringing on board? These and more we seek to find out from Dr. Osahon Enabulele as he joins us on this episode of the program. Our complimentary segment, Nature's Corner, would get you enlightened on what happens when you store your wa drinking water in a plastic. Thanks for joining us on the program. watching health options and we are glad to have with us in the studio the newly elected president of the Commonwealth Medical Association Dr. Osahon Enabulele to let us into what he is bringing on board and what Nigeria his home country stands to gain from his position. Glad to have you join us on health options Dr. Enabulele. Thank you very thank you very much I'm and glad to be congratulations here. Congratulations from all of us here. Thank you very much thank you very much. Yeah how does it feel to you know, emerge as uh, the president of the Commonwealth Medical Association. Wow, it's, uh, it's a very huge, huge um, relief uh, because for quite a long time we have been trying to see how we can get, you know, greater voice for disadvantaged uh, communities, countries and jurisdictions even within the Commonwealth. And you know at that level a lot goes into considerations for persons who seek to, of course, uh, be at such policy and leadership positions within the Commonwealth, uh, looking at all the disparities and the inequities that are bound within such. Uh, uh, so it's, 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 it's always a challenge to see how you can get the voice of persons from this side of a divide. Uh, to get you know recognized at that level and so it's taken over 14 years really mm. of consistent engagement at that global level mm. uh, before it's now got to the point of realization that uh, this was just the time to have a shift uh, to allow at least a Nigerian for the first time in the 57 year history of the Commonwealth mm. uh, to head the organization and bring something different uh, to the table of the Commonwealth. You, you were once um, the president of the Nigerian Medical Association. Absolutely. And your track record speaks for itself. For instance, okay. I know you conceptualize uh, the uh, he uh, National Health Summit of Absolutely. the NMA, and that yeah. was in 2013, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, and we knew what uh, followed some of the great achievements that, you know, you know uh, came as an aftermath of that. Uh, uh, summit Absolutely. and now you, you you are occupying a higher pedestal and yeah. I know what NMA does back home can you just let us into what your area of covering what's your mandate what are you supposed to be because we really don't know much about the activities of the Commonwealth Medical Association can you just briefly let us into before we now know how <laughs> Nigeria could leverage on it having oh. <laughs> one of us you know driving uh, the affairs well basically the Commonwealth Medical Association has broad policy objectives, uh, one of which is to strengthen health systems in the Commonwealth, to help to strengthen health systems in the Commonwealth. And that is through building the capacity of the various national medical associations uh, within its fold mm -hmm. uh, to empower them to be able to make substantial contributions towards the strengthening of healthcare systems uh, within their jurisdiction. Uh, secondly, is the issue of strengthening the rights of uh, citizens of the Commonwealth to health care. In other words, uh, supporting their rights, you know, their fundamental rights to health and, of course, access to health care services. Another objective is uh, with respect to the issue of medical ethics, uh, promoting 
uh, medical ethics in the various Commonwealth countries and ensuring that the physicians uh, that populate the various uh, national medical associations in the Commonwealth uh, uphold the uh, medical ethics. And again, the, we also have the objective of collaborating with the Commonwealth Secretariat, uh, which of course is situated in London, and of course other Commonwealth organs, including the, uh, uh, the Commonwealth uh, 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 ministers, um, they have the Commonwealth uh, uh, group of ministers, and of course we, they meet regularly, uh, annually, and so it is our responsibility to also uh, interact with them, collaborate with them, and see how we can jointly push the health agenda. Okay. Looking at the membership of the Commonwealth, now we know that some countries, even within the Commonwealth, are more developed than others. Absolutely. Some Absolutely. have things working for them more Absolutely. than others. And you know where we are, you know, as a country. Yeah. Um, having seen the peculiarity of African nations, and especially when you look at um, our health indices, looking at it from a broader picture, as Africa, as a continent, then coming down to the sub-region and yeah. back home yeah. as a country. Where do you think, yeah. now that you know you've been given this opportunity, what is, what's going to occupy your attention? I'm going to be focusing on uh, low-income, low and middle-income countries, and indeed the developing countries of Africa. Uh, that we, you know, drive a lot of the uh, agenda, um, or, I mean, prepare the agenda uh, that I intend to, of course, drive during my tenure, uh, because we, we must get to a point where we can have what I call an equipoise between those who are developing and those who are already developed. So we must deploy more resources, more attention, uh, more focus to those uh, uh, countries. And of course, for me, Africa is a major, you know, uh, preoccupation. Will be a major preoccupation, preoccupation during my tenure. For instance, if you look at the the burden of healthcare, mm -hmm. I mean, the burden, of the disease burden. Uh, globally. Yes. I mean, you find out that in Africa, for instance, Africa, in spite of its population, has 25% of the disease burden globally. But yet, you, it has only 3% of the health workforce, which is critical towards driving, you know, quality healthcare service delivery. And Africa has only 1% of the global health expenditure for health. And that tells a story that if we really want the whole world in terms of the whole new dimension of the SDG 2030, if we really want the whole world to move into that space, to move, to attain that destination, to get to that destination, then a lot more resources should and attention should be focused on those economies and countries that are really struggling that are really not there. Let's look at uh, universal health coverage, which is a global concept. And you know that um, uh, Nigeria, like some other, like other nation, has vigorously been, you know, striving to really, you know, keep up pace with, you know, the way nations are expected to move. But um, somehow, where, where our pace is not really the way it should be. What's your take on that? Nigeria has a lot to do uh, to be able to, of course, uh, ensure that it moves in line with the expectations globally in terms of uh, achieving universal health coverage. And that means that all the ingredients, factors, and elements that are supposed to be, of course, uh, driven uh, must be given the needed attention and priority, uh, ranging from the issue of innovative health financing, uh, which, of course, was supposed to be through the contributory health insurance scheme, uh, of course, pretended by the national health insurance. Uh, we must get it right. Uh, we must look at those factors that are you know, preventing, you know, realization of the dividends of what is on ground now through the National Insurance Scheme. Because all over the world, it's not clear that unless and until you have that kind of innovative social security system, then you just may not be able to get it right. Because once you have people spending out of their pocket more than the ordinary, in fact, it is said that if you spend, if the, I mean, household expenditure, what is called the out-of-pocket expenditure, most greater than is greater than over 60 percent of the health expenditure of any economy of any country then of course you are not really making progress and in nigeria that has to be tinkered with how do you not create what is called financial risk protection for the people of this country only four percent just now in terms of the nigerian environment i'm sorry i have to been since you asked about nigeria mm. in the nigerian environment mm. since 2006 uh, 2005 when the nhis was flagged off for instance only about four million nigerians 
have been subscribed to the National Health Insurance Scheme. And that means that not more than 7 8 million Nigerians are on the scheme. So a lot more has to be done to get more Nigerians to be on that scheme. And that is why the whole concept of reviewing the National Health Insurance Scheme Act was very, you know, uh, welcome by some of us because then I was the president of the NMA when, of course, we collaborated with the National Health Insurance Scheme to see how we could review that. But it would interest you to note that between 2012 and now, we are still debating how to pass that amendment. Yes, why Why should this uh, take such a long yeah, and time? And that is why we need to prioritize... Why we know the difference it can make. Absolutely. Yes. And that is why we need to prioritize health and health care. Unless and until there is some greater political commitment towards issues of health, you find out that you may not be able to make much progress. For instance, if there were things that were touching on the political aspirations of some individuals, I'm sure it would get accelerated you know, reading, accelerated passage, and accelerated ascent. They're taking into consideration the political will that the current administration has shown, in, in especially you were one of those who championed uh, the enactment of uh, national the, Nas yeah, the National Health Act. And of course, 2018, 2019, funds were provided you know they were captured in the budget and now we have uh, even disbursement to states up to maybe 15 states including the fct right now which a lot of people had uh, you know described as um, you know a demonstration of uh, the required political will expected so w w I, I don't know we, we seem not to be making my program but we're moving we are moving What's your take now that you are at the level you are now? Are you going to bring, use it to maybe find a way of, you know, getting key players to change the narrative so that we can, uh, you know, make progress as it is? Let me also commend Mr. President, President Muhammad Buhari, for that great political commitment uh, towards giving expression to Section 11 of the National Health Act that talks about the Basic Health Care Provision Fund. So now that has come, but the, the major uh, expectation is that it will not all be about release of funds, it will not all be about appropriations, but about tracking the utilization of those funds, which is critical, mm. especially within the milieu of corruption, within a corruptive environment. So you need to be able to manage it in a way that the people that really those funds are meant for, for get the benefits. And I think that is a critical challenge that they need to handle. And I'm happy that the current minister seems to be having that in mind, and I hope that they can follow it through so that Nigerians can begin to get the benefits of the Basic Health Care Provision Fund. Now, talking about what the Commonwealth can do, what in my presidency I intend to do is to be very, very objective and realistic. And that means that first we need to again do a very critical objective situational analysis of all the healthcare systems in the Commonwealth. We need to be able to have evidence to intervene in any jurisdiction because countries in the Commonwealth have their different situations. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to have a benchmark for saying, okay, we want to intervene in country A or country B or country C. And that, that means that in my first quarter, I intend to, of course, get the Commonwealth to do a thorough analysis of the healthcare systems in the Commonwealth so that we can have evidence to intervene. And if the challenge in Nigeria, for instance, is health workforce crisis, which, of course, is very preeminent all over the Commonwealth because Commonwealth, again, has a, the, the most challenge, I mean, is most challenged in terms of health workforce uh, 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 availability. You know, out of about 50 of the other countries globally that are seriously challenged in terms of the health workforce, uh, the Commonwealth has over about one-third of those countries. I mean, the, the one-third of those countries that have serious challenges with their health, health workforce reside in the Commonwealth. So a lot we have to do with what we find from our situational analysis. And then we cannot say, okay, we want to deploy innovative solutions, new ideas, or even the resources, the little resources that we have at the Commonwealth level to country A, country B, country C. And again, the Commonwealth, for instance, has a huge expertise. And so if we feel that we even need to, of course, empower you know, physicians or other health workers within some jurisdictions, we can deploy our expertise in that direction and get people from maybe UK, where they are on the basis of the Commonwealth intervention, Commonwealth medical association intervention to say, okay, maybe you can impart some skills here, you can impart some knowledge here, or even through our digital health technology. Yeah, I was going to that because yes. uh, a whole lot of um, focus was on it. Your yes. predecessor, you know, hopped on it. I yes. equally talked about it. Yes. The digital health thing, what, what are you bringing on? It's now realized and with evidence that one of the ways we can bridge the gap in terms of access to care, especially in rural communities, in remote areas, is the use of innovative digital technologies. 
to impact on healthcare and health access to health services. And that is all what digital health is all about. Using innovative digital technologies, which can be either use of um, information, communication technologies, laptop, uh, computer systems, mobile phones, and all whatnot, other forms of technology, to see how you can innovatively uh, bridge the gap in access so that people, even without traveling far distances, for instance, can access health, can access services, healthcare services, can access health information, can have their health seeking behavior altered, modified in a progressive and positive way through you know, quality transmissions you know, from the digital health uh, uh, platform. And the Commonwealth Medical Association, I mean, in my time, will try and ensure that Nigeria becomes a hub you know, of, um, of uh, I mean, the Commonwealth Medical Association Hub or Digital Health, uh, because some others have been established before I came on board. So we'll try as much as possible to see how Nigeria can benefit from that so that we can also explore the uh, experiences of uh, uh, the Commonwealth Medical Association. What's the ten, uh, duration of your tenure? Wow, my tenure is three years. Oh, three years. And it started running. Wow. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I have a very huge challenge because... Uh, uh, the Commonwealth um, needs a lot of renewed vibrancy. I intend to massively engage people from all the Commonwealth countries. So first of all, in fact, the first thing I'm doing now is to even uh, do what I call a perception survey uh, in those communities or countries where there seem to be very poor information about what we even do in spite of the 57 years of existence. And then from there begin to impact on their realistic expectations in a way that before I end my tenure, just the way I did with the Nigerian Medical Association, I think the Commonwealth Medical Association should be a household name in every country. Yeah. And not just be the household name, but impacting on lives, yeah. impacting on health systems. Yeah. I'm also going to have a peer review mechanism mm -hmm. established where every year we assess healthcare systems in various, various Commonwealth countries and rank them. Oh, Nigeria is the first in the Commonwealth in terms of health system performance. Mm -hmm. Oh, Kenya is number two, number three. UK, oh. Is it still number one or number two mm, within yeah. the Commonwealth? So that we spur. Yeah, that will no know, doubt keep countries on their toes. On their toes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Saho and Nabulele. We wish you all the best. Thank you very much. In your you may not know the interaction between the water you drink and where you store it. Our focus is on what happens to water when stored in a plastic, as we take you to our nature scanner. As I had explained to you that we have been losing the immunity due to our food, and not only food, the most important thing that has happened for the human race in the last 40-50 years is the use of plastic. For convenience, we have started using all the food materials being transported, packaged, and uh, we are actually consuming uh, our food in the plastic. Uh, slowly, we started using water bottles, which actually has become big danger for the planet. So these water bottles, if you make the water sit for more than three to four hours, the variations of the temperature while transporting from the refrigerator to the room temperature, the nanoparticles of the plastic are slowly getting into the water and we are consuming the water. So the nanoparticles go and start coating the epithelial layers of small intestine where our micronutrients are being absorbed. So the micronutrient absorption place in the small intestines has to be hydrophilic. That means to attract water and to love water. But then what are we doing in the last 30-40 years? Using plastic to carry water, to drink water. For everything we are using plastic, even to filter water. All the technology uses this plastic. So we are carrying the nanoparticles and coating our intestines, small intestines where the absorption of all nutrients and micronutrients take place. So we have made that place hydrophobic. So the micronutrients and vitamins are not being absorbed properly and that is the beginning of loss of immunity also.
So, if you drink water properly, that means what is the right water then? What is the right water? The water that was before our ancestors running water. When the water runs on the surface of the earth, after it rains, it accumulates the salts and micronutrients and running. When it is running, the potential energy that was present becomes kinetic. So, when the kinetic energy takes the water in the stream starting from high to low, water always flows from high altitude to lower altitude and that energy keeps the water structured. So, the oxygen and hydrogen gets lined up due to the positive nature of hydrogen and negative nature of oxygen makes the water structured and all the nutrients that are to be present, micronutrients, salts get into this water. So, the TDS is right and the water is structured. But then when you store water in dams and then make it run through plastic and then go to filters and you have bottles and you are storing them, then the water loses its structure. So now, practically, we are not going to go a stream and drink water nowadays. So what do we do? What do we do? And that's where comes the knowledge of ancient India. All through, thousands of years ago, the Rushis, we call them, they always stored the water in copper vessels. Copper vessels. Copper vessels. So the copper, due to its wonderful and unique nature of having free electrons on the surface, the electrons are running around. So the water molecules, that is oxygen and hydrogen, get structured. While getting structured water, when you keep the water stored in the copper plate, so. What we can do now, take the water, put it in a mud pot of 20 liters of mud pot and then keep this That's clay, clay, pot. clay pot, yes, called, we call mud, M-U-D, clay pot, correct. Or you can even take the porcelain, that is ceramic pot, but never a plastic container. So you dip this for a period of five to six hours, the water gets structured. The toxic materials, the chemicals, the viruses all get attracted to this plate because of the free orbitals, uh, electrons running around. So what you have to do is take this plate out and clean it with a sour juice of tomatoes or lemon or tamarind. And again it is ready for the next 20 liters to be cleaned. So this is perpetual. You can go on and on using this plate and you have the best water in the world. So please use that kind of water to drink, to cook and for all the purposes that your body is connected. So even if you want to take bath, take bath from the copper plate water, you are going to be healthy. So what does it do? When you consume this water, the hydrophilic nature of your intestines gets back. So you, if you want at the background level you got to use the siridhanya as your basic food and then the next thing you need to correct is how you do drink water, how do you clean the water. And this water you can always carry in a steel bottle but not in the plastic bottle. And so this is the best water to drink. Of course, we are all now used to the plastic water. Wherever you go, you just buy a plastic water, throw it away. And that is a very bad thing for the environment too. So allow me to drink little water. So that water you take and store it overnight in a clay pot and have this kind of copper plate. This can clean around 20 liters of water overnight. But don't forget to clean this on a daily basis. And that is our package on this episode of Health Options. A quick reminder that you can watch the upload of this and other episodes of the program. Email us for your comments and contributions at healthoptions at nta.gov.ng. My name is Rabi Abdullah. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.